Well, last time we saw some incredible behavior on um, the comet Teryumov Teremosenko or P or 67P, and uh, the gravitational field here is um, uh, you know we're kind of roughing it or averaging it. it it's certainly variable. It would be on the order of about 3.7 milligals, uh, or about 3.7 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. So. Last time we got <clears throat> a sense for uh, the behavior, uh, you know, in really low G environments, um, and it, it's it's uh, fascinating. And uh, so we get we get a sense of what it would be like to live in a low G world of Comet 67P. Uh, local geology. If we come into the central Appalachians and we go over into the valley and ridge, we can see these broad uh, thrust sheets that extend uh, for several miles across the region. And they produce anomalies on the order of about 1 to 5 milligals. Uh, so we're in that range. We're in the range. If you're driving in a car, you know, pr probably through most areas in the Appalachians, you're experiencing changes of gravity on the order of one to five uh, milligals easily, uh, and that you know, would be similar to what you might experience on uh, Cheryumov uh, Gerasimenko on, on a comet. So something that you just you just are not going to notice. So we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, factors that uh, affect planet scale variations in G. And so we're, we're really just talking about, OK, what is the acceleration due to gravity at any point on the surface of the Earth? And if we're going to answer that question, we have to think about what's going on with the Earth. <clears throat> and you know, obviously, you've gotten the idea already that the acceleration due to gravity is not constant uh, on the Earth. And uh, there are several factors, there are several um, features associated with the Earth that, that cause uh, its uh, gravitational acceleration to change from one point to another. So uh, if we take a look at the, you know, if we compare the gravitational acceleration at the poles to that at the equator, for example, we have to remember that the Earth is an oblate spheroid. It's equal Toriel radius is greater than its polar radius by about 21.4 kilometers. So at the pole, you're going to be 21.4 kilometers closer to the center of the Earth than you would be at the equator. So you're going to, you're just going to, just by that fact alone, you're going to weigh more at the pole than you do at the equator. <clears throat> so that, um, that, that difference is about 5,186 milligals, and we can just calculate it, uh, uh, calculate it directly uh, using, this, uh, using this equation over here and convert into milligals. So this is uh, almost 10 times the acceleration due to gravity on Phobos that we talked about. So these variations of um, acceleration due to gravity with latitude uh, obviously need to be corrected because they are not associated with features underneath the surface that we might be interested in as geophysicists, geologists. So we have to compensate for them. Uh, we have to eliminate them from our observations. And of course, these are large regional scale variations. Uh, so over short distances, you, you can ignore them. But over distances of a few miles, you can't. Um, <clears throat> there's something else that we'll have to come back and talk about. We'll do that later, but also the influence of the Earth's rotation and centrifugal uh, forces. But another thing to think about is um, variations in the acceleration due to gravity associated with uh, uh, mountains. And when they were running surveys in order to determine the length of a degree of latitude, and they were doing this back in the 1800s, they realized that there, 
the surveys were going to miss tie because the plumb bob would be pulled off by the mass of the mountain. So they, they knew this. They had an idea of the average density of the mountain. And they you know said, okay, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to compensate for this. And and after compensating for that, they found that they still had a mist tie. And they attributed they they they, they reasoned that, that mist tie you know, they had made every they had done everything else correctly. So that mist tie had to be associated with the correction that they made for the deflection of the plumb bob associated with the mountain. And they found that that deflection was really not as great as they thought, and that the mountains either weigh less than they thought, or that there's some mass deficiency beneath the mountains. And of course we know that, um, you know, nowadays when we think about uh, plate tectonics and continental uh, cratons and so on, we, we, we know that the um, lighter continental crust has a deeper crustal root. Uh, there were two th theories that emerged. One was the theory of Pratt and uh, uh, another by Airy. Uh, Pratt reasoned that, well, okay, we could, we could account for this uh, mass deficiency just by assuming that maybe the density of the mountains decrease as we get towards their central higher peaks. <clears throat> that seems a little bit uh, unreasonable because, you know, if you been on mountains, you've got similar rock types here as you do over here. Uh, this is the model which we think of most often today, uh, Aries model, where if we have a mountain which is jutting up uh, so many thousands of meters, uh, it's compensated for by a low density uh, crustal root, low density relative to the higher density mantle. And uh, so this is referred to as an isostatic uh, anomaly. The uh, lower anomaly that you get after correcting for the presence of the mountain is associated with the deeper crustal roots. So these are variations which are certainly of interest to geologists, but, but if we're kind of interested to, to know what's going on inside the mountain or inside the root, then we need to compensate. We need to remove the effect of the root. And uh, uh, so, so the easiest analog to relate to is that of an ice cube and you're floating in your favorite drink, or that of an iceberg, uh, you know, where we know that uh, uh, we're only seeing the top tenth of a much more extensive uh, ice accumulation floating through the oceans. Here's another question to think about. Does water flow downhill? And you're thinking, oh, what kind of a question is that? Of course water flows downhill. But <clears throat> we, we, we typically think of you know, the surface as a surface along which the distance to the center of the Earth decreases uh, or doesn't decrease, is, is flat, or if it does decrease, is it downhill? We normally would think of it as being downhill, but is it necessarily downhill? That's the question. And uh, of course it turns out that um, we can describe the shape of the Earth uh, easily using a mathematical relationship. And that's the, um, the ellipsoid, uh, the oblate spheroid that we talked about. And um, when we talk about uphill and downhill, we're really talking about uh, whether or not the gravitational potential changes as we go from one point to another. So a surface along which the gravitational potential does not change is considered to be flat uh, gravitationally. However, um, these surfaces along which the gravitational potential is a constant referred to as the surface as the geoid surface are not flat <clears throat> and the reason that they aren't flat is because there are density contrasts beneath these beneath di different uh, um, 
areas of the Earth's surface that either make the potential uh, less at this longest lip ellipsoid surface or more along this ellipsoid surface so that the uphill and downhill, the concept of uphill and downhill on the topographic surface doesn't necessarily apply to uphill and downhill gravitationally. So we could actually have a ball rolling uphill if the gravitational potential were less uh, in the uphill direction. And we see that when we look at geo geoid height anomalies on a global scale. If we were to come here from the Indian Ocean, let's say Sri Lanka or the southern tip of India, uh, we're at about uh, minus 80 meters. If we come through Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, uh, across northern Australia, out uh, towards Hawaii, we are up, uh, well, we are up about 60 meters here. So there's, we've actually gone uphill about 140 meters. Uh, if we get over to Hawaii, we're going back downhill again. And, and so on over towards the uh, eastern coast of the uh, U.S. and uh, North and South America. So <clears throat> when you think about uh, um, you've actually sailed your boat uphill 140 meters, um, but this is just a surface along with which the gravitational potential is a constant. So 160 meters uphill here. Uh, another thing that you may not have thought about is that uh, when you look at the, you know, and it seems intuitively that, that this should be the case, if we have a seamount um, in the, on the ocean floor, that's going to produce its own, you know, local perturbation in the Earth's gravitational field. We're going to have a little bit higher gravity over the, um, over the seamount uh, than we would in an area without the seamount mount. And that seamount effectively is going to pull water towards it. So we should have an elevated um, sea surface in this area. And <clears throat> this idea was taken advantage of uh, back in the late 70s with the um, uh, Geosat uh, satellites they sent radar beams back and forth down to the uh, ocean surface you know, several, several hundred times a second so that they could get kind of an average estimate of what the sea surface height was as they were in their orbit and you know doing this several times over a long period of time and that is how this map of the ocean floor, the topography on the ocean floor was actually uh, developed, and uh, so we can see some very. Uh, this is not a. This we're looking, of course, at the whole Earth here, but you can zoom in on some of these features and and see incredible detail. Uh, uh, just just all from uh, satellite uh, radar imagery, uh, radar travel times. So something you may not have thought about, and uh, we should talk about this a little bit more maybe next time. Um, why it was useful, why uh, the Department of Defense, Defense did it. And it's associated with um, uh, inertial guidance systems used by submarines. And, um, so it, it's important in that application. So gravity provides uh, interesting views of objects buried beneath the Earth's surface, objects that we can't see, and the environmental applications of gravity methods, anomaly smaller than a milligal, can be of interest to the geophysicist. So we've already kind of talked about that. We've talked about the pre precision of the uh, gravimeter in the milligal or microgal region. And here just quickly are a couple of examples. Uh, gravity anomalies associated with glacial valleys in Wisconsin uh, vary by as much as about four milligals. And we can see the little Asher marks here, we're in a deep, deeper glacial valley. If we were doing groundwater pr prospecting, we would want to drill our water wells in these areas where we have larger uh, negative anomalies. And the residual is something else that we'll have to talk about. Uh, we have to correct for everything. The 
you know, the shape of the Earth, centrifugal acceleration, isostatic anomalies, and so on and so forth. And uh, the residual gravity is something else that we'll talk about at the after we talk about the other uh, gravity anomalies uh, that, that are not uh, geologically uh, relevant. And here's another example of an, uh, an anomaly associated with the Taze River Valley. Uh, this anomaly here is about 2.5 milligals and minus 2.5 milligals over this buried glacial valley. So mapping the gravity over this area tells you what the extent of the, um, uh, the old glacial valley is. And then here's an example in a karst uh, environment of an anomaly uh, that's about a half a milligal. <clears throat> so we can see that we've, we've got quite a range of anomalies that we're dealing with and we'll talk uh, uh, more about this next time. Thank you.